we pulled teams together to create a regional team, and so that was what was going to be done uh, in this particular instance. We were pulling Dallas, Houston, and New Orleans together to form this uh, regional response in order to execute the warrants. We went up to um, Colleen, Texas, to Fort Hood, and we practiced for two days getting loading in and out of cattle trailers. This was a lot of preparation. People were worried about women and children. People we practiced over and over again. Um, had areas that were laid out there at Fort Hood where you trained. Um, um, we had the since we had the rear rear of the complex. We had some, you know, it was a tape model that was laid out on the ground so that you knew kind of what you were going to be looking at because I guess we had some good aerial surveillance that had given a good layout of the place. It was a bigger mission than ever had been done before by any of us, um, but because there were so many agents involved in it and it was such a large target. The night before, we were all kind of just a little antsy, you know, because it was big. At that time, we were starting to realize that, hey, this is probably the biggest enforcement operation in modern law enforcement history. No anxiety, no, nothing like that. Um, just, it, it, it was going to be another day at work. So with the two trailers that were coming up, you had New Orleans, uh, New Orleans and Houston were going, uh, I believe, that up to the ammo room because the idea was to get there to the gun room where everything was stored so that we could, you know, cut off the ability of the people to get there and to get to the guns and everything. And then you had uh, Dallas that was, um, that was in the front trailer that came a little bit further around uh, the front of the building. We had a news guy who followed us into the compound. Well, we didn't know who he was. And, you know, we were talking, what's going on? They said there's a, there was a vehicle stopped on the side of the road. And, uh, and come to find out, they didn't know this at that time, but after the fact, found out that that vehicle stopped on the side of the road was actually one of the Davidians. So then he's out there looking for this big story that's going to make his career and everything, and he's not real sure where the Branch Davidian complex is. If, I'm, if I, my memory serves me correctly, he was the, uh, the mailman uh, that, that lived in the compound, but also worked at the post office, he delivered mail. But he stops the mailman. Well, the mailman happened to be a Branch Davidian. And so people don't realize how one little ripple goes forward. And he was stopped on the side of the road talking to someone. And again, after the fact, um, found out that that person he was talking to was actually the reporter who was looking for directions to get to the compound. So that's how we got tipped off. On the way up there, the helicopter started coming over the rear of us, which was to provide the, the, the diversion, the distraction, uh, to pull their attention to the rear of the compound in the event that something, you know, that they did, you know, think anything was going on. That's the other thing in the preparation. We had done so much preparation, we realized at one point that the medic standing next to me had two medical bags. Well, there's no way he didn't have a gun hand then. So I had a medical bag in one hand so that he could have a gun hand and I could have a gun hand. So we're like some of the last two off that trailer. By the time I hit the end of the trailer, there's already gunfire. And then I'm like, that doesn't sound right. That sounds like automatic gunfire. And then I'm looking and I'm seeing the guys in front taking cover behind some cars. You got to remember, there wasn't much cover out there to take. So, and then I see the group that I'm supposed to be with is instead of heading for the front, they veered off and there's this scraggly tree and this old, kind of like a white bread truck broken down looking thing um, here. It, it wasn't really a band, it was more like a bread truck that's here and they're going that way and I realized they're shooting at us. And as the helicopter started coming up, the gunfire started to erupt and we could hear the gunfire coming from the front and then we started to actually encounter gunfire coming towards us. The question of the hour, who shot first? I think that number one, there's no question, they shot first. Stop and think about ATF's training. We train 
do I have a clean shot? Are there citizens in the way? Is there, I mean, there's such a pause before any officer takes a shot that it's amazing more officers don't get killed on the job. It became evident pretty quickly they didn't want us to leave. I mean, they shot out tires on the trailers and stuff, and underneath the bread truck there was rocks and gravel coming up. I remember running through those trees and uh, Jack Grabowski saying, are they shooting at us? <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking in my mind, well, those aren't bees going 100 miles an hour past our ears. <laughs> those are bullets, you know, keep your head down. And I never forget, you know, it's a, just as clear as day, there was a, there was a little, wagon that was sitting right outside the building and as we started making our way up there we could tell somebody was getting a bead on us and right about that time um, the wagon that was there all of a sudden it just I mean literally it something hit it and it just pew, all of a sudden it wasn't there anymore <laughs> and, and I'm not sure whether that was a 50 <laughs> but somebody had something pretty heavy I believe after two three I don't know how many unsuccessful ceasefires, then we had one that held and we proceeded to walk out. But the problem at that point is, since you've had these ones that have already not held, you're pretty sure somebody's fixing to shoot you in the back. So I can remember I had been um, wounded and I had my gun in my left hand and I can remember one of the girls stayed with me, one of the other agents, and we walked in a serpentine pattern to get out to the road, hoping that that way we'd be less of a target or whatever, because there's nothing out there. I mean, there was very little cover to be taken. Probably one of the eeriest um, things to hear on the radio was probably um, Kenny King uh, after he had been shot on the roof and rolled over into the courtyard and was down. And he was, uh, and you could just hear him, you know, he was talking about, hey, you know, guys, come get me, come get me, I'm hit. And then um, it was also very, hard because you're hearing on the radio that, you know, different agents have been shot, one's asking for help, one's saying that they're bleeding. And his voice, you could tell he was getting weaker and weaker and he'd come back on, a lot of radio discipline, you know, and he was on there, he'd come back on and say, hey, look, um, I'm starting to feel, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm blacking out, you know, come get me guys. We're waiting there and finally we get, you know, we get told, hey, there's some people that are, we, we got a team, they're trekking their way in there to help get you guys out. And all of a sudden, we start taking fire from down the ravine. I mean, you know, just, I mean, just the bullets just cracking off, you know. And now we're on the side of this hill out in the open, more or less, because it's hard to hide behind a little trunk of a mesquite tree. So we all hit the dirt now. Talk about those things after the fact. You know, we have on blue, okay, those are our BTUs at that time. Our uniforms were blue. And at, on the side of a gray, grayed out hill, you know, browned out hill in Texas in the, in the wintertime where <laughs> you know, nothing looks like you but you with blue on. So a couple minutes go by. It seemed like a couple minutes. might have been faster than that. But the shooting stops. And then all of a sudden this guy starts coming out of the ravine waving. He's waving his hand at us, you know, like, like the white flag sign, you know. And so at that time, you know, we, you know, kind of hone in on him, you know, and get him to come on up the hill. He comes on up the hill. We get him close enough to us. We back and turn him backward and make him back up to us. We get somebody out there to him and we are able to arrest him. He has a gun on him. We end up taking a gun off of him. And we ask him, is there anybody else down there? And he says, you know, there, I guess there were three of them. He says, you know, one's dead and the other guy ran off. All of a sudden, we come to that stream uh, on another end of the property, and we gotta cross it, and it's a good little open area. So if there's somebody, you know, they got a good shot at you when you're going across. So we decide, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do this. When I give them a whole big target to shoot at, we're gonna, you, know, you got a jackrabbit across this thing, and you know, and keep your body going. All of a sudden, um, Roger Guthrie, who was the, the sniper, is looking down the ravine and he's got his scope out and he says, stop, everybody down. We hit the ground and he sees the back of this guy. You want to talk about discipline and doing the job right. Um, I remember Guthrie saying, I've got him, I've got him, I can take the shot. 
and he's talking to Daryl Dyer. Dyer was an ASAC at the time, and he was the he would have been the highest ranking guy out there with us at that time. And he's he goes he says he says I can take him. I can take him. He says what do you see? He says all I can see is his back, but I can take him. And Daryl says to him, Keep him in your scope. Don't shoot unless he becomes a threat. I think once we all got out and we found out, you know, we started learning, you know, we, we learned that there were, you know, uh, the total number of people who had actually been uh, been killed. We learned that, that at that time. We also learned about the number of injured and some of the people who were injured. And we also learned about some of the things that were happening. Like, you know, we had no clue, but we kept hearing these big bangs, you know. And we knew that, you know, we knew that they had a 50 cal, but these were like bigger bangs. And we found out they were throwing frag grenades. They're not just breaking the law. They're, 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 they're waging full-out war on you. We were fulfilling a prophecy. He had made these predictions to these people that all of this was going to happen, that he needed, he needed us to show up and do what we did. And so I think it, the biggest fault is that I don't think we looked at criminals as criminals. We didn't look at them as people look at terrorists today. It's a totally different mindset. If you look at a suicide bomber or a kamikaze pilot that was willing to give their life for what they were doing, that was what a Branch Davidian was. You know, we came to work to serve a warrant and ended up in a war zone. <clears throat> After the initial warrant service, um, we actually had to wait for reinforcements to come. So we literally, after we got back to the command post that evening, we got redeployed, so to speak, to different locations, right? So we had to set up a perimeter. So we covered the main roads that were leading in, uh, and along with the help of the of DPS and the, uh, and the Texas troopers, um, you know, we, we set up, you know, as much of a perimeter uh, to keep people from coming in through conventional means anyway. We went back out there as a team because we said we're going to stick together. So we got out there and we're on the side of this road and it is cold. And you know we had on you know our you know jackets and everything but it was cold out there. And it's probably about, let's see, it might have been getting close to a little after midnight, one o'clock in the morning and these headlights start approaching us. And we're going, okay, you know, and I know, you know, I think uh, Jack had a shotgun, Mark had an MP, and I think I had my, you know, I had my nine, or I might have had an MP too, but I just remember us going, okay, you know, if, if this guy gets any closer, you know what, hey, just be ready. And so the vehicle kept getting closer and closer and closer, and eventually, you know, we started honking his horn and going, hey, hey, guys, hey. You know, and I'm going, we're going, what the heck, you know? He pulls on up, and of all people, it's Ronnie Carter from the Charlotte Field Division. Ronnie Carter led the, the Charlotte SRT, and they started driving earlier that day when they heard what was going on. And he pulled his team together, and they drove. And I just remember when he got there, he said, have him replay this one. He said, um, You guys got what you need? He said, yeah, we're okay. He says, where's your helmet? Lost it. Reach back in his car. Take this. You guys hungry? Reach in his car. Take this. He said, I'm going to be right back. I'm going to get some people. Y'all need to get out of here. You don't need to be out here after that. 
That guy showed me what ATF was all about. I don't care where you were from. I don't care where you were that day. When the call for help went out, those guys came. And they came in droves. There's no reason that any one of those stray bullets shouldn't have had my name or anybody else's name on it. But the, um, but the people who ultimately paid a sacrifice um, trying to protect their own, um, no greater love.